I request Mr. Nipun to initiate the panel discussions. Over to you, Mr. Nipun. Thank you, Nanda. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, very exciting topic. Uh, I think Nanda said rate of interest, but this is return on investment on digital experiences. Just to be clear, what we are going to talk about today. Uh, it's a power-packed panel, but it's a very tough job right after lunch to keep you guys engaged, but we'll try our best. Um, I'm first going to start with a couple of pages to just set the context for us in terms of what are we really going to touch upon over the next hour. And we'll try and keep the last 10 to 15 minutes for questions. So, uh, you know, keep thinking about your questions that you want to ask towards the end for all our panelists. So, you know, what we did as part of our Fiveback study is that we actually conducted this survey. And the survey is actually not a small time kind of survey. This is about 1500 respondents. And the question that was asked was that as you think about buying a banking product, what channels do you prefer? And you know, the surprising answer is that 65% of everyone that was questioned about this came back saying they prefer offline channels. And 35% came back saying they prefer digital channels. And we said, you know, there, there could be nothing more exciting to try and figure out this puzzle and see what our panelists think about this. But you know, as we tried to unpack this response, what we figured is people actually came back saying they prefer human touch. They, they feel the processes are often complex and time consuming. They'd rather have somebody assist them. And they might have also heard from some of their acquaintances that the experience could be rather poor. You know, is there something that can be done to disrupt this? What are we experiencing? What's our strategy looking like to address this? The second area that we want to touch upon uh, is the piece where we actually want people to spend time. Right? In onboarding, of course, the idea is that you spend the least amount of time possible and you get done and get going. But as we think about, let's say, our, our own mobile banking app, the idea here is that you're fighting for time, you're fighting for engagement. But in this case, you know, there are, there are 35 lakh apps on the Play Store. There are 1.8 lakh apps that are added every month. There are 1.4 lakh apps at any point in time that have a rating of 4.5 stars or more on the Play Store, right? So as we think about engagement, you're not fighting against only other mobile banking apps, but you're fighting against everyone else out there because time is same. And that is how the engagement battle is unpacking itself. So we want to touch upon this second topic to see how do you get the customers to actually spend time on digital and that is uh, heavily interlinked with the, the return on investment that we were talking about. The third theme that we'll touch upon is that are we organized for success in this play field? There are two parts again. There is this first part which is the, the holy grail of saying are we really able to attract engineering and product design talent? And I've put some you know facts over there. There's a NASCOM report that said there'll be a shortage of about 15 lakh tech professionals by 2026 in the engineering side. And uh, you know on the design side, and this is again, you know, we'll, we'll try and see what our panelists are experiencing over here. But for every thousand engineers that graduate in India, there is only one designer who's graduating, right? So it's, it's super tough as we think about this. And of course, we'll try and delve into the areas of figuring out how do banks in their structures today, the way they're organized, which is product-led P&Ls, how do they come together? Because digital is one common experience. The customer is not thinking about you as a product p &L. The customer is hoping for the best experience. So that is the third thing that we'll touch upon. And, and lastly, you know, as we think about what gets us the highest quality design to get the, the best conversions, you know, return on investment is about funnel conversion. There is nothing else that gets you the return on investment in the, in the digital play field. Uh, when you think about linearly designed digital experiences, what you see on the first part of the slide is what you end up getting. If there is clean thinking, it appears like you know one chevron after the next, simple steps. But the customers don't think like that. They are often going in different directions. They need assistance. They are experimenting, exploring, doing different things. So when, when design thinking is applied to build digital assets, in our experience, um, in BCG, what we've seen is that conversions at the end of the funnel are often 1.5 to 2 times as compared to a linearly thought through digital asset. So we'll try and uh, delve upon that area as well. And finally, you know, as we think about um, our digital assets, do we think about them as just a mobile banking app, which is an alternate customer uh, service channel, and this is cost avoidance? Or are we thinking about digitizing such that this is an independent, standalone economics digital asset? It is acquiring customers, serving customers, and of course also cross-selling to customers. So those are the four big themes that we'll try and delve upon during the session today. 
So let me let me maybe start with you, uh, Shani. If I can ask you, you know, as you uh, on theme one, as we spoke about onboarding experiences, and we saw the 65 and 35 percent. What's your own experience in terms of, let's say, new to bank and existing to bank customers, or different asset or different liability categories of products? What have you seen, and what can one do about this? Um, thanks, Nipun, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Nipun set the context very well. Um, so I think um, there are two parts to what Nipun has been um, alluding to. One is which category of customer slash which category of product lends itself easily to a digital experience, and the other is how do you measure this and how do you kind of ensure you get success on these metrics. Um, so I think the fact remains, Nipun, that existing to bank is always easier, and I think most banks have experienced that and have evolved on that. By its very nature, you have enough information about the customer. You can pull out the information. There's enough technology to support it. So there is enough uh, evidence to show that existing to bank customers are. And uh, like I'm sure the fellow bankers on the panelist on the panel as well as in the audience will know. Many banks have evolved on existing to bank. I'll just give a couple of examples from Federal Bank. You know, if you look at our personal loan journey or our credit card journey, it's literally three or four clicks, and you're done for an existing to bank customer. So you, we use machine learning at the back end, take out a pre-approved customer, push it to the customer. If the customer wants the loan or the credit card, he says yes, and in three clicks, it's all delivered and done. Uh, that's the easy part of it. On the new to bank side, there's clearly a lot more complexities associated with it. The infrastructure has increasingly, over the last few years, made a lot of progress in being able to onboard new to bank customers in a digital fashion. Whether you look at Aadhaar, you look at CKYC, you look at Video KYC, there's a lot of work that has been done. And uh, kudos to the regulators, the government, etc., who have evolved a lot on this. And I think India clearly can, um, you know, position itself well on that. But I think it comes back to the point that you mentioned, which is uh, what your survey showed that. Whether we like it or not, you know, bankers may not admit it, but it is a complex process, you know. So there is a need to make sure that there is some assistance along the journey. So I think on new to bank, the, uh, a kind of semi-digital, digital process is what works well. And to make it clear, you know, I'll give a couple of examples again. Um, the first example we have in the bank is what we do with our car loans proposition. You know, we have a kind of a semi-digital process, if I can call it that, or a digital as they call it nowadays, where you have an assisted journey for the customer. So there is no paper, so it's completely eco-friendly slash digital. But yes, there is assistance to go through the process. Somebody just has to enter all the details on a tab. There are enough APIs to do all of the underwriting, et cetera. So it makes it quite seamless in that sense. But yes, with assistance, if you leave the customer to do it on his or her own, might not work for all categories of customers. So that's one example where I think digital comes in in a very large way. But there's another example from a new to bank customer which is very much digital oriented, which is what we do with our partners, uh, the new banks so like Epify, Jupiter, et cetera, which is completely digital. There is no human intervention at all. So I think the broad Shani, point- can I ask you, you know, in Sorry. your own experience, because you also have, you know, this, uh, uh, you know, different fintech partners that work with you. 6535 cannot be their answer, right? 6535 cannot be their answer, but I think broadly speaking, customers, when they look at it, they think of various products and probably come up with that answer. At, if it's a continuum, at this for a new to bank customer, at this end of the continuum will be a savings account, which is very simple and can be done digitally, but at the other end of the spectrum could be a home loan or could be a current account, which is still fraught with a lot of uh, friction in the account onboarding process. But I think the the, the broader point I'm making is that ETB is easy, NTB is also coming along that way, and I think there are lots of methods by which NTB can be made frictionless and seamless from a customer standpoint. The metrics around this are also important, and I think you alluded to that, which is to say, how do you measure whether you know it's really giving you the dividends you need? We do a lot of measures. We, we actually report statistics around how many accounts were onboarded completely digital and how many were onboarded through a semi-digital or an assisted process and com some, how many were completely manual. So we have metrics around all these three indicators to see what the mix is and how the mix does. Even within the kind of digital world, we measure what is STP completely, which is straight through processing completely with no human touch versus what needs human touch. For example, if underwriting needed a human touch, then it's like a negative point on that because you should have evolved your machine learning and your business rules engine enough. So it is complex. It is uh, product specific. It is customer specific. But I feel, uh, you know, if you look back to the last two years, three years, huge progress. If we're sitting on the same panel maybe two years from now, I think all of us would confidently say that we've moved along the continuum to everything being digital. Yeah. 
Fantastic. Thank you, Shalini. If I can just maybe poke a little bit to just see when you say completely digital and Rajan, if I can bring you in. You know, if, when we say completely digital uh, versus assisted and so on, does it start all the way from discovery uh, of the product itself? And you know, what are the kind of hacks that you've seen as you think about your own journey of getting this completely slash assisted digital mix right for your own bank? Um, well, I think uh, first of all, you you categorized the the customers beautifully well to say 35 and 65. So let's let's kind of you know begin from there. I think out of this 65 also, that is a struggling segment, which maybe 50 or 60, I don't know what is the exact percentage, has attempted or possibly potentially trying to attempt, but have not been able to go through. I think that is that is something fundamentally very, very important to understand. The second aspect is that uh, in the design thinking, instead of looking at from bank to customer, we have to reimagine the journey from customer to bank. And that's very important. The third part is that uh, whenever you are thinking of creating a design around the whole digital reach to the customer, it has to be thought through not in terms of trying to digitize your existing processes. Because it, it does need a different set of uh, journeys, a different set of expectation from the customer, and different operational way to for the customer to reach to the bank. So I think that becomes extremely important. Uh, in understanding what it is. Uh, our experience, talking from our experience, I think a couple of things which are very important is uh, when the customer is actually coming onto your digital platform, he wants it extremely simple. And when he wants simple, which means that you have to differentiate which customer you are providing, what journey, and to what level, right? So when we talk about STP, you cannot have a home loan or you know many other products as a STP. But can you think of a complex personal loan or a credit card or, you know, many of those loans which are otherwise pre-approved and sitting at the back for your ETB customer? So the journey experience for each one of them has to be very different. I think that is that is fundamentally very important. Which product lines you want to put as digital and which you want to put it as partial digital. The second important part also is that when a customer is, is actually, when he has decided to kind of log on, he's still testing because he, he does not know what is the kind of experience he's going to get. And his expectations can also be very different from time to time. So even if it takes five minutes for a customer to get a STP journey, even during that time, there are a lot of you know elements in which there can be a drop, right? Uh, uh, I, I, I want a loan, but I want to know the interest rate. I want to know the tenure. I want to know, uh, you know, uh, what is the amount I can get? I want to know whether there's a flexibility. I might like to know what is the foreclosure charges. So the questions can be many. So during that journey, uh, if you can also keep on giving, giving him prototype solutions available during that journey, I think is extremely relevant and this is what is being really appreciated. The third element is that uh, towards the whole journey, there are parts wherein he is not able to toggle through the system, right? He finds that there is certain need for him to either get in touch with the bank representative or simply on a chat, he wants to know certain things because he has certain quick questions which, which in your journey you have not anticipated, right? And you can't keep on altering your system because system is, is fundamentally the investment goes one time in creating that customer journey. So what becomes important is during that um, that entire journey, are there possibilities of conversation, uh, either digital or physical available? And last but not the least, if he wants to drop off, right, then to get back to him, one, to ensure that, you know, his journey gets completed. But if not that, then to understand what is going right and what is not going going right. I think this is these are some of the fundamentally very, very important elements whenever you are thinking of any kind of a digital design from customer to bank and then how to uh, get it executed. I have seen a lot of customers uh, actually come on to your digital platform uh, for purchase of one product, but their need is of, of two to three products, right? So you cannot also have an imagination of only one journey. Right. Don't make it complex to make too many journeys uh, or too many products to be sold, but but leave him with an option that 
uh, towards the 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 end towards the maybe 90% once the journey is completed as to what all are the other things which you also could have done and maybe either towards the completion or before you are doing it this leaves a great service back to uh, to the customer to actually let him know and last but not the least uh, once the transaction is completed I think it is important to ask him how was his experience and is there anything where you have fallen short on your expectation and that is where uh, a lot of work actually can can happen uh, to gauge the experience of the customer through that journey and, and how do they, they rate you. I think these are important elements. You know, I think Shalini, Rajan, both of you were uh, touching upon products to say that, you know, there are certain products that are just more friendly for, let's say, STP. Certain others are not. I wanted to bring Nitesh in. And so I can just come in, yeah, sorry. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. I don't mean to butt, but I think yes, uh, Rajan made a very good point about, you know, when there is a drop off and how you can intervene in that process. And I think that's a very, that's a, that's a point at which I think the moment of truth happens for a customer and how the, the physical or the human element and the digital element comes together. And I think today there are enough technologies that can help that. So, um, you know, something as simple as a sovereign gold bond, what we've noticed is sometimes customers drop off because they probably don't understand the flow or they don't understand the product. So if you could do a call back to the customer at that moment and there are enough technologies that can assist in that, the conversion rate becomes so much better and the customer satisfaction becomes so much better. So I think you made a very good point about the fact that it can be a completely digital process, but the, if there is a drop off and if you actually take that effort of calling the customer back and hand holding him through the process, the, the benefits the bank gets and the customer gets far outweighs the investment that you make in that. And that links back to this whole ROI point because there's no simple answer for some of these things, but small steps of that kind. And I think when he said it, it just triggered that in my mind that it's extremely critical to do that. No, yeah. I think it's a great point. I was just going to say that, you know, there is this product lens to say there are complex and less complex products. But is there also a customer segment lens? Uh, Nitesh, you know, and you know, especially for your bank, there'll be a fully stratified base, right? You've got all sorts of customers from, you know, all possible uh, uh, stratas. As you think about this, is there also, you know, a certain base that has to be assisted? Or do you think that, you know, everybody has to gun for, let's go digital, STP? Thanks, Nippon. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm very discomfortable, uncomfortable with the first slide that you showed, about 35, 65. So I would like to run the poll again in this audience. <laughs> and that will also check how many people are really alert. I don't know how lunch. stratified yeah. this base is. The so the audience, the question is that given the option, how many of you would like to do the retail digital journey on the mobile app? Please raise your hand. See, that looks like 97 and You have to do the poll again. <laughs> Your poll you have to run again. <laughs> yeah. Nipun, but yes. I, I think I wanted to make a point. Every time you show two numbers, the absolute value of the numbers are not as important or how quickly they're growing. Yes. Right? So 35 might be low, but it's growing much, much faster yes. than 65. Guys, you can't so do it on data. It is fact. Okay? <laughs> this can... <laughs> so the point is obviously this audience is very different and the, your uh, poll sample will be quite different. And therefore, but it's very surprising for us also. So while the reasons, that three reasons that you have listed, all of us are aware of that through our customer interaction, but we are not aware that 65% is that. But you know, there are also several studies, uh, and Rajan also said that there are many customers who are starting the journey but dropping off. So perhaps they are also coming into that 65 because we are not providing the assistance and uh, at the drop of stays. But there are also studies which shows that those customers who are contacting the bank digitally, they want higher level of engagement immediately and instantly. You know, so the perspectives are very different. Even if you take this 35%, so almost two third of this 35% as per studies want to have very higher and deeper level of digital eng engagement. That is what is actually we should look at. And I think uh, we should not be pessimistic uh, and digital leaders, technology leaders, we should, should not be pessimistic with the poll results. Because see, today, what the trends, if you see three broader trends, what is happening in the banking space, there is a complete migration from the application-based approach to the platform-based approach, which has customization, which has interoperability, extensibility, and that is what is actually in the interest of the customers. And second is from the traditional system of records, we are now moving to system of experiences. And that is again, not only about the customers, because a bank cannot create the good experience for the customer unless we are able to create the similar kind of good experience for my employees, for my administrator, and for my leadership. So that is a very important uh, aspect of this. 
And the third aspect is movement from high touch to low touch banking. Everybody, every class of customer wants few steps in order to close their banking transaction. So these are the very important trends which you, we are seeing. To your specific question, I would actually disagree and I will disagree with what ma'am also said about the ETB and NTB. Uh, in my view, the digital assistance is relationship agnostic. In the sense, digital assistance may be required for ETB also, it may be required for the NTV also. What we are seeing that uh, two factors which determine the digital assistance, one is the class of customers, customer segment, and second is the complexity of the product. And I'll give you some examples from our experience. And you know, one of the data set one must remember that today still in our country, there are more than 500 million of population who do not have smartphones. And when we talk about digital and all these discussions, it is for those who have some smartphones. And obviously, we are not today, every bank is initiating products for even at the bottom of the pyramid customers who don't have the smartphones. So obviously, they have to be digitally assisted. So what, uh, I'll give you one example. Let's say, if we look at the customer segment, which is digital savvy, and also a product which is very simple. For example, as ma'am also said, products like pre-approved personal loans or pre-approved credit cards. You know, the engine has already run in advance. So it's a kind of three, four clicks journey. And that too, it is for only those customers who are actually digital savvy. Because they have more transactions digitally, that's why they qualify. So for them, it's a very good experience. Now you look at the second type, where the product type is very simple actually like uh, Federal Bank and Union Bank, both of us have developed with the Reserve Bank Innovation Hub, the Kisan credit card loans, farmer loans up to 1.6 lakh. And you know, in usual journey, it's a kind of, uh, even if I uh, simplify, it's at least four or five rounds of visit of the farmers to the branches, thereby they are foregoing their income also. And in this case, it is happening in, you can say, few minutes actually. It's very surprising. Now, this product is very simple. Product is very simple. A farmer has to enter few data points only. But the customer segment is very different. Again, they may, might not have the uh, smartphone. Even if they are having, for them to log into a particular URL or downloading a particular app for that and doing that journey is not easy. Therefore, we need to provide assistance. There are also customer segment is good, digital savvy. But the product may be a little complex. So let's say if I have to give a business loan of 10 lakh or 20 lakh rupees, I need much more information than a very simple product loan. So there, even the customer segment is digital savvy, the customer segment requires digital assistance. So these are the realities of life. And therefore, banks and we are also doing several things. So like most of the digital journeys that we are doing, and as since our belief is that assistance is required for both ETB and NTB, in most of the journeys, we are building the banker login as well as the my BC login. So the same product, which is actually a self-service product, a customer can go to a business correspondent and request him that, yes, I want a loan. Business correspondent will log in actually in his ID and assist the customer to do the journey. So in that case, I'm able to fulfill the requirement of the customer. At the same time, I'm able to track who has actually done this journey. So if there are any mis-selling, we can always track that. Secondly, now with the tools like CRM and the contact center, one can easily manage the drop-offs. But the most important thing I would say, and uh, that when we develop any digital journey, it should be like uh, zero basing of the end state. You should visualize, and as I said that, we should develop from the customer point of view, not from the bank point of view. So if we just go back maybe 18 months ago, most of the journeys were getting developed like they, banks were digitizing their existing branch-based journeys. You know, it was just digitizing. It was not imagination. Now somehow most of us are having those kind of imagination. That's why these are few clicks journey. So that's very important. And for that to be successful, it's very important that IT organization, digital organization, and the enterprise per se should have high appetite for failures. Because if this digital is not a destination, it's a journey. Yes. And therefore, unless you have high appetite for failures, will not be successful.
thank you you know this is this is so valuable as you think about uh, you know somehow thinking about like a cross section of segments and products and you know uh, uh, how different for example this can look like in, in terms of the asset itself including for the employee and for the customer same asset right but you know how about we ask shreyas this question right this is he comes from a different world you know we are bank first learning technology conversation here and you know, when you're tech first and learning banking when you think about engagement and when you think about digital how different does that sound so um, we've had a very interesting sort of journey with engagement and we have realized there are two kinds of engagement uh, there is true engagement which reads a lot of insight into human behavior you need to really understand what engagement means and then there is vanity engagement vanity engagement is very easy you can put a video in a app you get vanity engagement you put a game in an app you get vanity engagement but it doesn't do anything really for you right and when we started peeling these layers on what does engagement mean some really interesting things came out for us one of the most engaging things on on our app today is bank account balance check it's simple people want one place where they can go quickly check bank balance of five bank accounts and they want to do it in under 2 minutes and they do it up to 14 15 times a day there is nothing we this could is vanity do. engagement or this is the other one this is absolutely real there's nothing more real than seeing how much money you have in your bank account <laughs> i mean if they haven't spent it will remain the same but but it took a lot of it took a lot of conviction uh, to look at engagement in a way what does that mean to your business and what does it mean to your brand huh. and and just to say like when we look at engagement and i am uh, Rajan was talking about customized journeys. One of the things we really uh, sort of chase is what is different experience for different cohorts. Not just in terms of flows, in terms of look, in terms of feel, in terms of language, in terms of what verbs we use, in terms of what language we like. What is the what is the text on the button is something we obsess, yes. right? And that text on the button, there are at least a few thousand variations of that text. and they work for different segments and the tech seamlessly delivers a different experience for different customer every pixel on our home page is different for different users you can say for for shalini ma'am i want this pixel to be this and for rajan i want this pixel to be this and and that's the beauty that's the real challenge right like when we say personal banking why can't digital be personal we somehow forget that only human interconnection is personal but most of us talk to our closest friends on digital today so i think the challenge is to make digital banking personal and that means a lot of work on technology a lot of work on understanding what true engagement is and bringing this the entire experience together right from product technology design banking compliance bringing all of that together i think is this point around uh, you know what does your uh, button action button say you know of course you know as you think about so many experiments thousand experiments is at live at any point in time all of this can happen only when you've got some real solid tech in the background right and uh, and chandra if i bring you in you know experience is not just about it looks beautiful and you know things seamlessly move but the tech has to power it i can't keep waiting for a api to fire for 10 seconds and before i get to the next page right what have you seen sure that's a great uh, timing to come in after listening to all of the uh, different nuances that works really in a banking world and when i summarize it now it looks like i'm summarizing everything but my co-panelist said look from a technology standpoint what we have observed customers look for frictionless seamless experience number one let's look at what do they look for which means basically it doesn't matter what channel that i hop on to where i stop my journey where i restart my journey i would like the bank to understand where i left off what's my context understand and assist me or stay with me as i hop on to different channels initially when digital came on uh, everybody reimagined what could be the customer journey map which rajan alluded to which is the right thing to do today customer decides their journey you know they can switch their journey the tech has to be adaptable enough to make sure that you the customers can seamlessly decide their journey across the channels and and in a different different context that's one So when they look at again, uh, some of the co-panelists brought out in terms of the manual intervention, how much of instantaneous decisionings and resolutions can they get? If they're looking for certain products, certain decisions, if they're looking for getting things done, 
you know there could be variances with respect to what products can be completely digital what products can be digital but as long as a bank thinks from the perspective of the consumer to think through how much of straight through processing can you do how much of manual intervention today we have used to a lot of manual intervention which is which is a possibility when we think from the bank standpoint of digitization versus the customer first so when you start reimagining the business processes rather than just the digitization and put this adaptable customer journey as your primary so a way of uh, thinking through from a customer lens then look through everything that can that you can make as straight through as possible so that's other 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 part the customer data how seamlessly effectively holistically it is available to all of your channels who need that your advisors your own employees and for the customers their own set of data across different relationships that they may have with the bank different products that they may be interfacing with different products that they may be interested in and different services which are associated with your bank but not necessarily provided by the bank that's where the partnerships come into play that's where the extended ecosystem comes into play so how seamlessly we enable consumer to have that data and not just for them but for all of the different channels that assist the customer and again some of the points that came out around how can you jump in uh, in real time understanding the customer pain points assist them to complete the journey these are the ways in which we can turn that 65% on the other side of the 35% i i i'm sure that 65% is real i trust the data but thank you the the only thing reason they are real is because we are not providing the experiences that they want i think shreyas brought out it's time to make digital personal banking the only reason i would call up uh, if my personal banker is if i can't solve it on digital i would love to call them up but it's much more easier and uh, more uh, friendlier but if i can get it done and it's going to shift the generational shift that we see today they are not going to look for alternative of a personal banker they are going to switch the bank right would uh, for the experience of someone else that provides so looking through from a data lens and the legacy infrastructure which is uh, to your point uh, nipun the legacy infrastructure that makes it Uh, complex from data availability standpoint from a 360 degree holistic data standpoint from an integration api standpoint all of that also needs to be thought through so these are the challenges the legacy infrastructure the api first the customer journey adaptable journeys the data centric approach the context centric approach the personalization approach that is critical and making sure that uh, all of this data is constantly understood analyzed and the feedback implemented you know the journey uh, abandonment that uh, came up in the conversation is very high a topic in a retail environment for example just to learn it from a different industry in a retail uh, we see this shopping cart abandonment and for a retailer that's a big loss somebody put some things you know imagine walking to a physical store you put a ton of things in the tray and walk out of the door without doing anything or paying for it and that we do we may, we may not do that in physical environment so often but we do tons of times on the digital environment so that there's a lot to learn when a customer drops a journey when the customer gets stuck in a journey when the customer feels that they are sort of confused on how how to go about it there's ton of things that can be learned and programmatically intervened now there's a lot of technology that exists to intervene programmatically pick up the journey help them complete the journey so these are the few things that i think uh, nipun that helps so this is uh, you know this is uh, it puts things in context and i was just going to say that you spoke a lot about data right and monitoring and measuring data i was going to ask shalini you know as you think about measuring customer engagement what kind of metrics do you measure internally and who's accountable for them is it the is it the head of product is it the head of the channel how do you think about engagement metrics um uh, thanks nipun i think before i get into metrics probably it might be then appropriate to jump a little bit and look at structure and i think i may be jumping the gun a little bit uh, but sure, nipun sure. uh, pardon me for that and i think different banks have obviously adopted different structures but i think i go back to what rajan said which is who is kind of uh, where does it rest to look at it from a customer perspective rather than a product perspective traditional bank structures have always been uh, for various reasons product oriented so even i i do have a product head for 
current accounts or product head for something, savings account for personal loans, etc. But what we've done, at least in the bank, is about five, six years back, we actually created digital banking as a separate vertical by itself. And what we said was let let digital banking be independent of the product teams, let digital banking be independent of technology, let it be independent of others. It's within the business, it's got a set of business metrics that it needs to work on, but hopefully that team then thinks customer rather than um, a product. And uh, the team has, uh, and you know, the structure has worked for us very well. Different banks have attempted different structures, they could be successful, but this works very well for us, which is to say that digital banking is run as an end-to-end -end customer experience, looks at it from a customer standpoint. The product teams work very closely with the digital team to ensure that they deliver on the metrics. And um, the metrics are typically co-owned so that there is no um, dispute in that respect. Uh, two examples that are immediately there, uh, come to mind. Um, I think most banks have now invested a lot in video KYC capabilities. The, the video KYC for and by itself is really not what is required, right? It's got to lend itself to getting a new to bank customer who then would take a savings account with us or a couple of other products with, uh, from us. So the, the channel, which is new, uh, video KYC, is owned by the digital banking team. They are responsible for ensuring the customer experience is optimal, the drop-offs are optimal, the technology works well, the customer experience works well. Uh, and uh, the beneficiary, therefore, is the savings account uh, product head who then has got a mandate to say you need to onboard X number of accounts per day through this channel. So there's a healthy friction between the two also because they both become then responsible to make sure that the channel works correctly with the end objective in mind to get the um, customers onboarded. Uh, similarly, we've got uh, metrics around credit cards, personal loans, etc. So to your question on who owns the metrics, it's a joint ownership, at least in Federal Bank, and we found that to be the most effective because it's, it can't be either or. You know, the channel's got to work well, the customer experience has got to work well, but at the end of the day, a customer buys a product, right? And then you can cross-sell other products. So, so, you know, the product owner also has to have a stake in it. So that's how we worked it out. The metrics are pretty well laid out, uh, approved at various levels, and tracked relentlessly virtually on a week-on-week -week basis to make sure we deliver. The end objective, obviously, you know, I keep telling my team at least, digitization is not for the sake of digitization, right? I mean, it's got to lend itself to an objective of either increased revenue, lower costs, or ideally both. If I can get higher revenue at lower cost, that would be the ideal position to be in. But we, we measure all of that and we have metrics around all of that. It's evolved. It's evolved over the last few years and I think it's a journey of evolution all along. But the broad point is the customer experience gets owned by one team who then makes sure that they optimize resources for the right level of customer experience. Arbitration happens and we have a, it normally comes up to me and I have to take a decision on yeah, it. Yeah. It, it. It has to bubble up for some kind of arbitration right now. As I think about, and, and Rajan, in your experience, you know, what have you seen? Product P&L heads and banks are the strongest guys, right, aren't they? And, uh, and as digital becomes important, it's not really about just the channel, but the, the core business itself also gets impacted a lot in terms of their own P&L, in terms of the investments that the channel is getting itself, right? As you think about the collaboration in your own experience, how is that working out between the channel and the product P&Ls? Uh, so it's a it's 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 a pretty uh, uh, complex you know uh, problem which most of the institutions you know go through. Um, unfortunately, in our life, we try to make things more complex for our own convenience at times. But uh, I think the the clear design in terms of the thought process of what you are trying to do, the crux of it always has to be to keep the thing simple, right? If you will keep the thing simple then whatever you evolve out of that thought process would also end up as a as, as something simple and not very complex. So before we get into who's responsible and who should be uh, shot dead if there is something wrong, I think most important thing is how do you put it, put it across? How do you create it, right? Uh, the fundamental thought process is, uh, and, and Shreyas did speak about every customer wants a different experience. So it's not just the journey. It's also about what is the kind of feel he gets when he comes into into that platform, right? So uh, can I, if I, uh, I mean, let's assume for a minute that there is a banking app and that banking app is used by a 70-year-old person, 50-year-old person, 30-year-old person. So all three are using same. So can I say this one app is meant for all three? Answer is no, right? It cannot be, right? Uh, so it, it becomes very important that when you're creating these journeys, when you're imagining, 
when you are crystalling, when you are crystallizing the whole concept, it has to be done uh, as a joint team. And uh, there are beautiful words like garage or a pod or whatever you call it. But, but, but you know, end of the day, all the folks have to sit together and put their minds together. The good part is that the expertise is available in subsets, right? And unless you are not successful to put those subsets as, as, as one unit, right? And then start imagining it, right? It doesn't work. I'll give you an example when, when we, are, we are in the process of creating uh, a fantastic app and when we, we thought of you know, imagining it, uh, then the concept was let us get the best of the guys around from technology, digital, this and that, you know. And then, then you know, once, once the, the team was put up, they all brought the young folks also along with them. And then when I went to this garage after a couple of months, I could see that all the old folks are sitting quiet and the young folks are actually jumping around and they are talking and they are talking about the innovation. They are talking about very new and novel things which were not actually being thought about by others. So clearly the responsibility to create that platform has to be a joint responsibility. It has to be a team which is only working on this and not trying to also solve the problems in the physical journey and the digital journey and the phone banking journey and the digital journey. So there should be one team which is kind of, you know, putting their heads together to create it. And the success and failure depends on the entire team and not any individual department. That I think is extremely important. The second important point comes is that when this is being created, right, one of the basic mistakes which people do is that they, they forget to get the, the data team involved there, right? So it's all that design, it's all about technology, all about product. And then we think that the journey is complete because all these folks are putting the, 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 you know, their, their time and energy together. But then there are a lot of functions which is marketing, which is data, which is credit, which is, you know, because we are talking about certain products which are credit linked. So all these guys, including, you know, uh, e even your, your, your other risk barriers which you put in, the, in that journey, right? If you do not have them right in the beginning, then it is going to create a problem later. The second part comes is that once you have something ready as a platform, right? This platform is not static. It's not that I've created a process and that process will last for the next five years. It's not something like that. The market, the expectation, uh, as I said, customer to bank is, is completely evolving. Maybe he's getting uh, today, you know, fascinated by something what Paytm has, has built and when he comes back to the bank, he wants a similar experience. How can I tell him, hello, this is what I want and this is what I will give it to you. It's not in my hand. I have to give him what he wants. So uh, this, this team's journey does not stop with, with concept seeding and development. It's a dynamic world. It is going to change. It, there is a constant development which is going to happen. So this team has to remain together. That is number one. Number two, please also understand that as you, as you run, you also learn and unlearn, right? You have to do both actually together. And the ROA is actually dependent on your conversions, your experiences. Never forget that every time a customer comes on the platform, he's also assessing your brand. It's not just your ex his experience, right? He's also creating a notion about your, your brand. So you have to be extremely careful. So whatever he has ex experienced, good, bad, has to flow back into the platform in your understanding in your evaluation and in your implementation. Hence, it becomes important that, uh, and in, in various, like, like ma'am said, that you know there's a separate team or digital which works. I think in some or the other shape, whatever novelty you want to add in terms of branding that team or naming that team. But this team has to be an extremely agile team, which is unlearning and learning at the same time, evolving, it's, it's an ever evolving uh, process and I think it has to undergo that. So the responsibility has to lie squarely and equally between the product teams, between the platform owners, between the data team, between the technology and everybody else. And that is how it can it can function. Uh, I have seen a lot of uh, snacks getting created wherein, and forget digitization, I'm talking about simple technology, right? Wherein the product team tells technology that please go and create it, right? And they give their first brief 
and the poor guys from technology they created and come back and they said hey this is what you said and see how beautifully we have created in such a minimal cost and when the product team tested it this is very different from what i told you right or you took one year to create it but during that time you know the market has changed right so those are very simplistic things from a technology point of view here you are talking of a direct customer exposure right and hence this has to be far more agile uh, far more dynamic in nature and hence you have to be very careful when you are trying to create responsibilities whether it is roa or conversion rates or customer experience nps etc whatever whatever dimension you talk about but it has to be together put on to the entire team so that they are pushed or pulled to constantly evolve what they have created thank you uh, i i have a slightly different take okay and and i want to bring this in like there used to be this theory a uh, de decade ago that good digital products have three kind of people there's there's a hacker who writes the code there's a hipster who can see in the future right he can see what needs to be done and then there's a hustler who is in charge of growth right he makes things grow in our world view there's a fourth person the banker right so there's there's a hacker hipster hustler and banker now one of the problems i have seen running some of these teams is shared responsibility does not really result in deliverance right because somehow between those four people somehow the end product doesn't get owned by anyone right so what i've actually seen work well is the, the owner of this vision can be any of the four there have been teams where the ultimate owner of the product has been the banker there have been teams where ultimate owner of the product has been a hacker so as long as you're open enough to say between these four roles anyone could be the end owner of of delivery we've seen better success rates because then that one person makes it his life's mission to deliver it right versus no i i i think you you made a very relevant point maybe i missed on this uh while so that is where the concept of creating the digital bank within the banks is is, is there because there is somebody to hold this team as well right but the team has to have equal participation from all because you might like to i'll just give you a small example uh you know uh leave the the tech side or the innovation side in terms of digitization sometimes it is reimagination of your operational process right it is which is the simplest of the thing that do i need these 50 signatures or do i need these 10 consents or do i need this consent at all right it can be as simple as that right and that's where the uh, the the role of people coming together really works but i completely 100% agree with you that there has to be a owner it could be one of them generally it is from the business uh, because he is responsible to deliver but but extremely important that it anchors somewhere else and and you know then the uh, then it kind of you know goes around just to add that uh, shreyas i think you're right one person but i think it boils down then to who actually owns at least in the banking context the pnl and the balance sheet because all of this ultimately has to deliver for um, you know all our stakeholders and has to deliver to things so uh, as rajan says um it's not an easy solution at times but um, yeah so you or nominate one person who carries that as his kpi if it is a, a personal loan journey and that person has a mandate to say he's got to deliver 100 crores of disbursements every month through that journey he jolly well go he or she jolly well go around and get it done that's what we end up uh, we have to do and we do but it's not as easy as that because there are uh, not just between digital and uh, a product or business there is risk there is compliance there is technology uh, all of them are involved regulatory compliance um, you know you've got to deliver a kfs by uh, a digital sign off you have to bring that in into the process so there's regulatory compliance there's operational risk cyber security so it does become complex but i think you're right about the point that it's best to have one person pnl accountable or balance sheet accountable as the case may be everybody's then's got to rally around to make sure that person becomes successful i think yeah we've, we've got this view on accountability is getting slightly clearer and of course there are different contexts as we think about it right but uh, now let's get to the money you know and and there is also this nuance which is saying that digital often ends up becoming a guzzler of resources right you keep investing you keep investing and you know while you are measuring let's say some metrics but when does the money come in and is this 
you know, many banks and institutions actually talk about this being long gestation. It take, takes a lot of time before you can actually recognize that, oh, you know, here is the economic value. This is what's happened. Chandra, if I can ask you, as you think about this for different institutions, have you seen some variance in how people measure ROI on digital? No, absolutely. I think that's a key question. Uh, at Wipro, when we look at different successful examples, one uh, think through from few points that came up, multidisciplinary teams. One is, of course, who leads it, but multidisciplinary team that get together as a pod, as a garage. Experimentation, fail fast. How quickly can they actually test out from a customer centricity standpoint, provide that particular feature, look for the adoption, pull back, uh, make the aspects of technology as agile as possible so that the innovation can be extremely rapid. So today the biggest challenge or a need for an IT uh, system supporting business is IT is no longer supporting in, in a wrong, in, I'm probably using a wrong sense, IT is the business or technology is the business today. Right across the globe, every, every uh, banker or every bank or every other institute calls themselves as a technology first and a banking industry later. So when we think of enabling IT to match the business agility, we can't have one year, six months, eight months of gestation of certain rollouts, which may not be market valid by the time it comes out, but ability for IT infrastructure to be as agile as possible. And this multidisciplinary team, test out, fail fast, bring back the results, experiment, those are key. And when you think through from uh, making it as personalized as possible, as context sensitive uh, aware as possible, your ROI can improve. And again, same thing as making digital as a personal banking. How effectively can we turn this whole thing as, as if it's only thing that we have developed for that particular customer. It's completely new for every segment. The offers are a, a completely thought through, contextualized, personalized, and uh, enabled through a continuous improvement cycle. You know, we observe, we understand, we bring back, and we uh, learn that whole uh, journey and the channel. So those are the few things. I'll just take an example on how it can have an impact. So one of the bank that we consulted, they had a problem in terms of the churn of their credit card consumers. You know, they were losing a lot of credit card consumers. And when, when they were looking at what could be the possible reason, one of the observations that came through from an outside in research with their customers was when there is a dispute on the credit card for that particular bank for any customer, they had to make multiple calls into their call center, every time repeat the story, and it would take over a week or two before some resolution can come. So when we looked at journey, now translating or changing that journey to a digital first journey, what it meant is right off of their mobile phone, they can dispute any particular line item. That triggers without a manual intervention a straight through process, a decisioning system, which basically pulls all of the different spend patterns data of the consumer. And 90% of the cases it was decided or the decision was delivered to the customer with no manual intervention, which means all I, all I need to do from switching to a week or two weeks of call center back and forth calls was just dispute a particular credit card line item and I get the resolution in 90% of the cases. So which means, again, uh, to your earlier point, Nipun, about how do I make sure the backend legacy systems are taken care of? How do I API, microservices? And how do I think from the customer centricity as, as a key metric and the process simplification as a key metric? Right? So those are the few things that can have a big ROI. Right. You know, and uh, I'm just going to build on what you just said. And last question from me, and Nitesh, this is for you. And then we open up to the audience. Uh, so, you know, I was just going to say that, you know, Chandra used this example of saying credit card dispute, you know, call in the call center uh, and so on, right? Now, as you think about ROI on, let's say, digital properties that you're building inside your bank, do you think about this as cost avoidance because this is a mobile banking app, you know, somebody can just go self-serve? Or do you think about standalone economics to say this has to also sell on its own? Maybe even NTB, maybe even ETB, it doesn't matter. But, you know, do you think about this as a digital bank property being built? See, the stage at which banks are today, and uh, I will speak mostly for the public sector banks space here. You know, this question is like uh, asking someone in, in fancy that how much you'll score in the board exam. We have just started the journey. 
And you know, if we start thinking from the ROI perspective that this investment you are making and what will be the dollar ROI on this, I think we'll not be able, able to take off and that will be quite demotivating. At the end stage, definitely we should have the visibility and thankfully not only within the banking sector, but if you look across the sectors, whether this is FMCG, pharma or any other sector, it is almost an established fact in India and globally that digital and technology and digitalization is going to be cost effective, is going to be multiplier on the revenue and also very efficient on the risk reduction. So that's a fact end stage we'll do. At this stage, I don't think we should look at uh, ROI in every uh, aspect. Also because there are products which are developed very well but the adoption is not happening and adoption is not happening what I said earlier also because of multiple reasons. So what do you say? Is it the product is not good? That's why ROI is not coming. What is the reason? So I think this is a developmental stage with time we'll see that ROI will start coming in. See the first and foremost important thing in this uh, making ROI possible is obviously migrating the customer from the traditional banking, branch-based banking to the mobile-based banking. And therefore, it is not about only migrating and saving the cost, but actually making a customer aware of how much he can or she can do through the mobile banking or the mobile app. That is very, very important because that will start the engagement journey and revenue journey for the bank. So in my bank, I quite oftenly, I address and say that if a customer is not using mobile bank app of Union Bank of India, you should not treat that your customer. Perhaps that customer is using Union Bank space only as a parking space. Because that customer must be using the mobile banking of one bank or the other. If not today, sooner or later. So unless you bring all your customers onto your mobile app, it is not going to work. So that is the first step required for ROI. Going forward, if we have to look at that, how to measure the ROI, I think there could be two, three matrices. One, obviously the top is the, because what the board will look at and uh, CFO will look at the business part of this business outcome, which is like uh, revenue gain, cost optimization, reduction in risk. And there would be some associated business outcome related matrices like uh, how much of fee income has been generated through the digital products only. You know, like one example I'll give you in the bank, we have introduced fully end-to-end -end digital uh, product for the trade finance. Now, in this product, a customer can actually start the journey, initiate the journey and fulfillment will happen completely digitally, no need to visit the branch, they can do from their convenience of their home and this. So again, this is a product where the share of fee which is coming through this digital only will be the key metrics for, for the ROI. And, and that doesn't sound very fancy like that sounds, you know, really mature. Yeah. Yeah. What you're trying and, to the, and the third part will be the technology related technology outcome based metrics when we should measure for the ROI. And I think today we are in this stage that for the purpose of ROI, we should measure only the technology outcome based matrices. And if I have to give example of couple of those, one I said that how many of my customers are actually using the digital channels? Unless I migrate them to digital channel, how do I measure the ROI of my digital channels? That is the first part. Second part could be that those who are using my digital channels, how many of new products and services actually they are buying through the digital channels or they are on mobile, but they are still going to a branch to buy a product that will not solve the purpose. So these are the things which will help us measure the ROI, but I would still feel that uh, most of us today are into very early stage of uh, being the ROI outcome based uh, organization. If I can just add to that, I think Nitesh has uh, summarized it quite well and uh, it is still in its infancy. Having said that, I think most people are aware of the fact that, um, you know, starting from the next quarter onwards, all banks are required to uh, declare digital as a sub-segment within retail. Yes. Um, so you've got retail overall in your in your quarterly results and we've now got to start digital, showing digital. So I 
think uh, Nipun, you will have a lot of uh, data to start doing research <laughs> on from January onwards because that's the quarter in which I think it will go live. So, yeah, I mean, I'm sure we'll all evolve on it. I think definitions, IBA is helping us, RBA is helping us to get those definitions. But come January, February, you'll have a lot of data to be able to do some Hopefully. analytics around it and tell us how we're doing. Hopefully a different result in the next five years. I, 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 I just want to add one thing. Uh, Digital serves two things, right? One, it serves as an efficiency improvement. And we spoke a lot about efficiency improvement, how it is cheaper to service someone on a digital channel. But one thing, because we are early, we don't realize this digital will also serve as a new product creation, right? Which will broaden the market and bring in new class of products who will automatically have better ROI than old class of products, right? And this has happened over and over again. What was a Google search ad before there was search? Right? That class of product didn't exist and hence multiple billion dollars of revenue didn't exist. Right? So it's up to us, all of us to think of what would be digitally native banking products which today are not feasible. Right? And I think that will unlock a whole new segment of ROI which, which obviously till we discover it we won't know it. Just one point, I think yesterday uh, in the presentation also in the opening address, it was said that initial period will be actually cost heavy because of the investment in digital and technology. So I think in that period, it will be very difficult to have a positive ROI. And post that, and we are luckily seeing the very high level of adoption that is happening in the customer for first time using the digital, and then once onboarded in the digital, continue to remain on the digital only. As I said in my opening remarks also, those customers who are actually coming on digital, they are looking for almost very heightened digital engagement on the platform of the bank. So I just want to add uh, a different dimension to it. Uh, you know, when it comes to the ROI on digital platforms and, you know, how is it performing, uh, a little bit of reimagination is also essential in terms of should technology be the cost which you should or investment which you should consider for the digital platform alone, right? Because what is happening is you are also getting an opportunity to look at your your technology stack right and when you are evolving it you are making it more agile so while you are doing it with the purpose of adaptation of the technology pipe coming to the digital channel at the forefront but it is also helping you to reimagine your some of orthodox models on the technology so i always dispute that should the technology cost be only taken as the digital cost or should it be actually at a, at a bank level where you have started reimagining? I think that becomes an extremely important point. Great points. We, we're just going to open this up for audience questions. Uh, hopefully, oh, oh, there are quite a few. Now on this side. Uh, my name is Mukesh. <laughs> I worked with SIDBI and State Bank of India. I was, uh, when SIDBI was setting up Stand Up India and Start Up India portals, I was enrolled and then so later on Threats platform, India's first platform which was set up uh, in collaboration with the National uh, Stock Exchange. So we worked on that. So what I have seen all throughout this period is that that journey from, to digital uh, banking is taking taking care of only one aspect of lending. That is process part, post-sanction uh, process part only. Because a public sector bank, the concept, as I understand, is digital banking only post-sanction process to be taken care of through digital process. But nothing much is happening on uh, the development of uh, the, any product, digital product, uh, as Mr. Shea has pointed out, where the fintech company has taken lead. So in public sector bank, nothing much is happening. All products are still traditional. Uh, the threats platform was developed based on uh, industrial financing product, build discounting products, which were already uh, in use. But nothing much has happened from the product side. And our appraisal system is also traditional, like uh, nothing, not uh, much of AI is being used there. Still risk appraisal is traditional and credit appraisal is traditional. So anything is happening on development of a product for future, that's next five years, which are not backed by assets. Anything is happening for industrial finance. 
Retail finance is taken care of, but nothing is happening with regard to industrial financing. Thank you. Uh, so this is, the, I think the, the panel here uh, doesn't come with a particular background from where this question emitted, but let me, uh, let me give you a, uh, you know, when you are looking at digital, first of all, there are three parts to it we have to understand, and that is sales, service, and, and cross-sell, right? I think uh, while we all talk about sales, I think a lot of work has happened across the industry on the service part, right? I mean, just, just look at what Shreya said that account balance, it's a service, right? Somebody wants to know his balance is, is a service. But just an extension to what you said, I think uh, the larger market, also the safer market, perceived safer market in today's context, is also the MSME and the, and, and the corporate world, where there is enough and more products which are getting developed. And uh, what will happen is that once you start imagining, reimagining uh, the journeys, the customer profiles, in, uh, you know, in continuation of that comes the emergence of new and innovative products, right? So, so instead of imagining a product and then creating it, I think automatically a lot of products are getting created. We at Yes Bank, when we are creating solutions for our MSME, it is not just, it is not just about lending, right? Because lending is just one part, it is one transaction, right? But beyond that, various spectrum of services which he might need during the course of his his life cycle right each one of them uh, have to be really created co-created with partners within the institutions or in the entire subsystem having said that i think it is a it's a very interesting journey which has just started right uh, 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 today to a shopkeeper you say that you know, come on the app and, and take a loan of five lakhs or something, right? This is these are kind of products which were always perceived to be very risky, but today they are they are in for real, right? So likewise, the solution side of the banking, I think, is uh, I would not say whether it is moving at a faster pace or slower pace, but definitely a lot of work is happening in kind of creating those solutions for the customer, and hence it is very important that now I'm I'm repeating it that. Anything which is digital is not from bank to the customer. It is always from customer to bank. And if he has 100 solutions, what he need, then the institutions, whether it is banks or the fintechs, will have to constantly look at how best you can provide those, those solutions. So I think it's a journey. Uh, people are well into it. Uh, some understand, some don't understand. Some don't prioritize it. Uh, or, or some are still trying to find out some solutions. So when Shreyas was saying, saying, you know, these hackers and, you know, he used four terms and he said the bank uh, as the fourth one, I would add a fifth one, there is also a uh, compliance and a regulator also. The banks have to, <laughs> you know, also, also understand it. So I think within that framework, whatever uh, has to happen is happening at a very rapid pace. Uh, uh, just, to, uh, just a quick one to add, and I think your question was probably more specific to the um, small and medium enterprises and that kind of sector. Clearly, yes, a lot more work needs to be done. But I think some of the enablers have also come in more recently. So I, I think everybody knows about account aggregator. And if account aggregator scales up and it is uh, going to be kind of the next UPI, if account aggregator scales up, the ability to do underwriting based on cash flows, the ability to do underwriting on line of sight on kind of what the customer's transactions is, manifold, uh, you know, improvements. So I think virtually all banks are innovating around those to see how best we can balance between customer experience, risk, uh, profitability, various metrics to be taken into account. And there are a huge amount of experiments, not as evolved as retail, which is probably why this panel is, most of us are retail out here, but clearly advances. And I think the next few months, we'll see a lot of progress in this. I think the governor yesterday mentioned that if a calendar year 2023 is going to be the year of digitization of SME. So uh, clearly a lot of progress will happen on that. Yeah. Should, should we take one last question from the audience? Do you wanted to add something? Sorry. Please. I just wanted to add that uh, he spoke about the not new products we are seeing. I think new products definitely is an opportunity, but the kind of friction we are seeing in the existing product for millions of customers, I think that is the key problem that we should solve first than going for a new product. So your retail customers, your farmers, our MSME enterprises, 
there is a lot of friction everyone is experiencing in the traditional way of doing banking so all of us what we are doing today is trying to make that frictionless and obviously that will take us to the newer journey of innovative products new product lines first of all thank you to the panelists for a wonderful discussion uh, my question to the bcg um, presentation that given that uh, design thinking that been utilized by designing the products so it's a do you think that's a really is a, a time consuming and the cost associated with and the how the banking system is taking into board in the public sector and the private sectors and uh, if you quote some examples that really from the public sector private sector that they have been you design thinking to develop their products and their carbon carbon rates are much higher as compared to linear you yeah, can have share share some examples as you think about designing your own products when you have on ptm let's say uh, versus let's say the kind of uh, products that we today have with evolving products that we have on mobile banking apps do you see any differences from a design standpoint and what kind of examples can do you want to quote from there I, when i wrote out my bio for today i had written a line i i i want to say it i think design is a lot about how things work than how things look a lot of time we get obsessed by how things look but like every customer journey is about how things work and how things work spans a lot more than how they, how we do design like design thinking like it gets repeated a lot but the practical apply, applicability applicability of design thinking is is at the top of the funnel where actually retention happens through the funnel right so i i don't think the way banking apps look today the way paytm looks today i don't think it's too different right i i think fundamentally they all look good like i i that change has happened in the last 4 5 years all the apps look good now right but what all of us struggle with and i'm party to this is how to make it work well every time and that's a very multivariate problem so you know if i can just add to what uh, she was saying just before you know i was just going to say that you know design uh, unfortunately gets interpreted as like you said a ui right it's not about the look and feel and the color of you know what's flowing through but he actually made a point on what is written on the button there was a point on when it drops off it gets into a call center instantly there's a point around somebody in the branch can assist you because it's omni channel all of that is design and that is how the experience has to get designed on day 1 it's not about launching something because you build something straight through and we you know in in our own experience in bcg we actually call it the stp trap what that means is that when you design a journey for the first time uh, the the most amount of time gets spent on the stp swim lane which is often the thinnest after you've launched it because you know it could be 5 to 10% of what is going through straight through in the in the first case like let's say right but actually there's a lot of drop off into other swim lanes and we often don't end up designing for it in the first place but all of that is design including in the call center including in the branch including for the employee all of that is part of the design this is just what you know what i wanted to say on the conversion rates i'm sorry just one last line on that what we say at least is ui ux is necessary but definitely not sufficient if you can't get i mean if you can't get the customer experience right on an end to end basis including that last edge case which you know one out of a million customers probably uh, faces you you know you could end up with harakiri on social media at least you know that's a good summary of uh, you know the the discussion we've had ui ux is necessary but not sufficient hi on that note on that note yeah. i think we are out of time i am you sir my name is buchu babu i am advisor at it to bank you know yeah, that can you hear yes, me sir yeah. that's last question yeah the, what i mean to say is definitely we have been talking about customer experience yeah we talk about everything but why do we lose in each transaction are you making a tra money or losing trans in every transaction you are losing money banks basically when i'm doing in millions of transaction definitely the loss is more when the name of casa or something else or for future business why only banks have to send money at 2 and 1/2 rupees or 5 rupees to transfer whereas other channels in the same country charge 50 or 100 rupees are we looking at the cost of transaction that's what i'm looking at because i have been seeing because i'm advising a few banks also we are look at the cost of transactions and second thing is the ease upi why every bank has a different mobile banking app and different experience why upi is successful there was no age age bar everybody is doing even the vendors say like a sub block up upi they are using what i feel is this customer experience and all utility is also important and uh, the age is not a criteria that's what i believe unless somebody is very stubborn so these two things are one thing is about the kind of uh, uh, 
age age limit for using the app you make it useful everybody will use it that's what i meant to say second thing is cost of transaction i know how much it costs even banks are discouraged to open atm because of the cost of transaction in the atm let me be very frank on that just if anybody can talk on this sir thanks for you are the leader you are there in kci you are the metaverse and the union bank is doing a great job so can you come on that is there a question also in there uh, it's a good observation and stand <laughs> it's it's an observation all right okay thank you so much thank